Giselle, sweetheart, come down for breakfast. I don't want to eat this tasteless omelet. I want cereal with milk. Don't be difficult, said the father to his 11-year-old daughter. Perhaps Eugenio was too strict with Giselle. He not only controlled her grades in school, but also her diet. The man was deeply concerned because Giselle had type 1 diabetes. He vividly remembered the day when Giselle received the terrifying diagnosis. Eugenio feared that diabetes, inherited from her mother, could affect his daughter, and unfortunately, his fears were realized. Luisana, Giselle's mother and Eugenio's once life companion and beloved wife, passed away due to complications related to diabetes when their daughter was four years old. Soon after, this diagnosis caught up with Giselle. The girl was plagued by thirst, became inactive and weak, and began to lose weight rapidly. Initially, her father thought it was related to severe stress, especially since it all started right after Lusana's funeral. Doctors also attributed it to stress factors, thus failing to provide the correct diagnosis. While Eugenio sought advice on helping his daughter cope with the loss of her mother, Giselle's condition worsened. Until one day, she collapsed and fell into a coma. Her blood glucose level was critical, it reached 30, while the normal level is 5. Eugenio couldn't sleep at night, blaming himself for being a bad father. How did I not notice? Why didn't I take her to other doctors? How could I not guess? It was so obvious. Previously, Eugenio was sure that diabetes was a disease of overweight adults. He was consumed by guilt. He couldn't bear to lose Giselle, his beloved daughter. Everything he had left. The girl was saved, but the diagnosis was bleak. Now they had to live by new rules, adhere to a diet, measure blood sugar levels, keep a food diary, count carbohydrate units, inject insulin, and so on. So Eugenio's strictness could be understood. He feared facing the loss of another loved one. Then he decided that he would do everything for his daughter, as long as she was happy and her life was as bright, beautiful, and long as possible. Dad, what superpower would you like to have? Asked the girl, sitting at the kitchen table and enjoying her omelet. Hmm. I don't even know. What about you? I would like to stop time. Just imagine, I would pause time, run to the store, and eat all the sweets there. And you wouldn't even know. Giselle stuck her tongue out at her father. The man laughed. Then I would like to have the superpower of a healer. I would cure all people, including you. And then you wouldn't have to pause time to eat sweets. The girl lowered her head, and Eugenio realized he had said too much. Dad, why is life so unfair? I also want to have cereal with milk for breakfast, like those kids in the commercials, and not have to take an extra dose of insulin with it. After a long pause, Giselle added, and I want to have a mom, or at least a stepmother, but a kind one. I would love her, and we would be real friends, and she would help me and give me advice. Sunshine, get ready, or we'll be late for school, Eugenio interrupted Giselle and stood up from the table. It was hard for him to hear that his daughter needed a mother so badly. It had been seven years already, and Eugenio still couldn't let go of Luisana. He couldn't even imagine kissing someone else. And despite his wife not being around anymore, he still felt like a cheater whenever he met someone new. Eugenio took Giselle to school and headed to work. Today was an important day. The boss would announce who would become the chief engineer in their company. Eugenio tried his best to get this position because with the new salary, he could afford to buy his daughter an insulin pump and provide for all her needs. He always thought about his daughter and spent all his money on her. He wore his old suit, worn out shoes. Maybe that's why women stopped paying attention to him. Meanwhile, Giselle, sitting in class, was thinking about how to introduce her father to some woman so that her dad would become happier and the girl would have a mom, or rather a stepmom. She shared her idea with her classmates. Girls, but I can't just meet some lady and suggest she go on a date with my dad. Yeah, that's weird. No one would agree, Paula replied. We need to choose a mom from people we already know. Do you have anyone in mind? interjected the red-haired Jimena. 
Giselle thought for a moment, then sadly stated, My dad doesn't talk to anyone. And I don't know any women his age. Maybe we could introduce him to our teacher, suggested Jimena. The girls laughed. Hey, I'm looking for a mom, not a grandma, Giselle said through laughter. When classes were over, Giselle decided to walk home instead of taking the bus. She checked her blood sugar level after classes, everything was normal. A walk wouldn't harm her. Passing by the church, she noticed a beautiful teenage girl handing out flyers. What does she have? Giselle thought and approached to take the flyer. Hello. What do you have there? She asked. We invite children and teenagers to our free seminar, How to Find the Right Path in Life, the girl replied. What does that mean? Giselle was interested. In life, there are many obstacles and difficulties. Sometimes it seems like God doesn't love us at all. But that's not true. He sends us signs that people don't see and don't accept. And we will teach to see divine signs, to accept them, to follow God. Come to us tomorrow after school. We're gathering in that small building behind the church. I'll come, the girl rejoiced and took the flyer. Giselle turned around and, looking at the picture on the flyer, headed towards home. But the young girl called after her. Wait. She ran up and said, Just don't tell anyone that you're coming to us. Neither mom nor dad. Adults don't hear God. They can lead you astray. After all, I didn't just meet you today for no reason. This is also a sign. Sure, okay. I won't tell anyone. Giselle smiled at her new acquaintance. And then she joyfully ran home. Today was a beautiful sunny day, and the 11-year-old girl was in the same mood. When she got home, she decided to have a snack. She took her food diary, calculated the bread units, injected the necessary dose of insulin, and started eating. All these actions were automated for her. After the snack, the girl ran to her room and pulled out her personal diary from under the bed. She opened it, wrote today's date at the top, glued the flyer the girl had given her, and began to write her thoughts. Today is a wonderful day. I was sad for a long time, but today I had the thought that I need to find a wife for dad and a mom for me. And when I was walking home, God gave me a sign. I met a girl who gave me a flyer and invited me to their meeting. The girl looked at the flyer again, where there was an image of some man, clearly not resembling the one she had seen in the icons in the church. Tomorrow I'll go to them after school. What if I meet a nice woman there? I'm sure God will give me a sign and everything will be fine. And Dad will become kinder and less strict with me. She finished writing the last phrase, quickly closed the diary, and hid it under the bed in the farthest corner. The next day, Giselle went to the building after school, which looked more like an ordinary house. She didn't tell anyone about it, not even her best friends. She was afraid they might lead her astray. She liked this puzzle, this secret. She felt like a part of something secretive. When she walked in, she was surprised. There were only four adults, and the rest were children or teenagers. The main one was called Theodore. He was the one depicted on the flyer. There were many chairs in a small hall, each with a piece of paper and a pencil on it. What's your name? Approached her one of the four adults. Are you here for the first time? My name is Giselle. The girl answered modestly, Yes, it's my first time. Don't worry. We'll tell you everything and show you. You'll like it. We play and communicate here. And most importantly, we listen to Daddy Theodore. God himself sent him to us and through him gives us signs. Believe me, your life will improve if you listen to Daddy Theodore. Why Daddy? The girl wondered. Because we're his children. You'll understand everything a little later. Daddy Theodore will start his speech in five minutes. Take any available seat. The girl sat down and picked up the piece of paper and pencil that were on the chair. After a while, a man in his forties with long black hair entered the hall. Daddy Theodore, the girl whispered. The man greeted the children and addressed the girl. Giselle? Hello. This is your first time with us, isn't it? 
The girl nodded shyly. In fact, I was waiting for you. I knew you would come. I saw you in my dream. I know you are kind and compassionate. I know everything about you. Let me tell you about us. About our family. For many years, I lived in darkness, like a blind man, not seeing the true light. My eyes were closed to the truth, and I wandered in the darkness of despair. But at one moment, my life underwent a metamorphosis. That moment became pivotal for me because I realized that my blindness was not only physical, but also spiritual. When I humbly turned to God, when my soul appealed to the higher power with sincere prayers, miracles began. God sent me signs, signs that revealed the truth and shed light on my path. I began to see things that were previously inaccessible to me, not only with physical eyes, but also with spiritual insight. My brothers and sisters, I saw miracles in every tiny detail of this world. I saw the power that accomplishes the impossible and the love that warms our hearts in the darkest moments. And today, I stand before you, proclaiming this truth because each of you is capable of this miracle. Let this moment be your awakening, your realization of the true power and love that resides within us and around us. Let your hearts be open to receive the signs of God, which will truly illuminate your path and fill your life with meaning and grace. By appealing to God with a pure heart and an open mind, we can find the light that shines brighter than any sun and leads us to the highest good. Let us walk this path together, guided by faith, hope, and love. Glory to God for His mercy and wonders. The children, as if on cue, synchronously began drawing something with a pencil on a piece of paper. Giselle, the woman addressed the girl. After the words of Father Theodore, you can draw anything that comes to your mind. You can write about your desires or thank the world that surrounds you. Will I give the paper back to you later? The girl whispered. Not at all. You keep it for yourself. Every day after righteous words, we draw and write. Because at that moment, God sends us signs. And what came to your mind, what you drew those are the signs of God. That's how he leads you onto the true path. Giselle thought for a moment and, looking at the paper, wrote only two words. When she got home, the girl felt unwell. Sugar spikes. She needed to eat and inject the necessary dose of insulin. It was fortunate that her father hadn't come home from work yet. Otherwise, he would have immediately noticed Giselle's painful condition and started bombarding her with questions. After the girl finished her meal, she heard her father's car pulling up to the house. Just in time, she thought. Giselle, I have a surprise for you. The girl joyfully greeted her father at the front door. An insulin pump, her father exclaimed excitedly. The girl couldn't believe her ears. She had been dreaming of this since the doctor told her about this device. But she knew her father couldn't afford such an expensive purchase. Today my dreams come true. What a wonderful day. With these words, Giselle jumped into Eugenio's arms. The man was happy, but a sad thought crossed his mind again. What do girls her age dream of? Getting a bicycle, a pretty dress, or an electric guitar? My Giselle dreamed of an insulin pump. At the same time, the girl was in complete euphoria. All evening her father taught her how to use the new device. They figured out the settings together. Before bed, Giselle pulled out her personal diary from under the bed and made a new entry. Now I know that all my wishes will come true. She took out the piece of paper from her school backpack, on which only two words were written, insulin pump, and glued it into her diary. At that moment, she decided that she would come to the small building near the church every day after school. With these thoughts, the girl went to sleep. Eugenio couldn't fall asleep. Despite everything going well, he couldn't shake off a strange feeling of unease. Maybe he was just anxious about his new position. He got out of bed and approached the window. It was pouring rain outside. The drops drummed on the roof, and that sound soothed him. Suddenly, he spotted a girl. Strange, to be out in such a downpour without an umbrella, Eugenio thought. She first walked in one direction, then turned around and walked back. The girl shook her head and tried to make out the street sign. 
Eugenio realized she was lost. Without hesitation, he quickly threw on a shirt and pants, grabbed an umbrella, and went out onto the street. The girl was standing in front of his house. Can I help you? Oh my goodness. I'm lost, and my phone died. I can't catch a taxi either. I don't even know where to go, the girl said with a tone of helplessness. Yes, taxis are rare around here. Let's go under the awning. I'll call you a taxi. Thank you so much. The girl gave him her address. Eugenio was surprised. This is the other end of the city. How did you end up here? It's a long story. Let me tell you another time. Another time, the man asked, surprised. The girl laughed. My name is Paulina, by the way. And yours? I'm Eugenio. Pleasure to meet you, Eugenio. And I'm really grateful for your help, Paulina smiled. Don't mention it, he replied, feeling a pleasant warmth inside from the unexpected encounter. How long have you been living in this city? Not long at all. I came here briefly for work. I live in the area where you called the taxi. I hope you'll have time to get to know the city better, Eugenio said, feeling that the strange feeling of unease that had plagued him earlier was gradually giving way to something else. It would be wonderful if you could help me with that, Paulina replied with a smile. Their conversation was interrupted by the approaching sound of an engine. A taxi pulled up to them. Here's your taxi, Eugenio said. Paulina gratefully smiled and got into the car. As she bid farewell, she added, until we meet again, Eugenio. Her words sounded like a promise, and he felt that this meeting would change many things in his life. The strange feelings of unease gradually dissolved into the air, making way for something new and exciting. Wait, leave me your number. We'll call each other and arrange a meeting, the man said, surprised by his own behavior. After Lusana's death, he hadn't even looked at other women. And now he didn't want to let go of his new acquaintance. But she had left, leaving him her phone number. A man entered the house. The feeling of unease vanished somewhere, and he, wrapped in a thin blanket, fell asleep. Throughout the following month, Eugenio experienced an internal conflict. On the one hand, he felt alive again, filled with hope and the possibility of love. On the other hand, he still couldn't fully let go of the past. The memory of Luisana was like a shadow, hindering him from opening up to new feelings. His daughter Giselle, on the contrary, didn't experience any internal conflicts. Every day after school, she headed to the secret club, that's how she described the community she recently joined in her personal diary. And she became a witness to the gradual transformation of meetings and teachings of Father Theodore. In the initial meetings, participants focused on conversations about spirituality, inner development, and finding the meaning of life. However, over time, the theme of the meetings began to change, and discussions turned to something much more mysterious and mystical. Participants began to discuss the existence of higher powers or cosmic energy, which, according to Theodore's claims, can heal and transform the lives of its followers. He asserted that this new order in the world represents a revolution in the ordinary understanding of reality and that their unity is the only means of achieving a higher state of consciousness and spiritual enlightenment. For Giselle, who suffered from a serious illness, these ideas sounded like music. Believing in Theodore's words, she soon became convinced that this organization had answers to all her questions and could offer her healing. Every word spoken at the meeting seemed to her like a divine message. She absorbed every teaching, every promise, believing that here she would find what she had been searching for so long. Children, my radiant children's father Theodore concluded his speech. A new era is coming, without diseases, without pain, without suffering. But the evil that exists in this world hinders this important revolution. Only you can change this world. You are special. It is within you that the power needed by this world lies. I am just a seer. I am just a conductor. I have seen a bright future where you all are transformed into luminous beings, free from suffering and disease. Believe in yourselves, my dear ones, and follow me to the bright future that we will create together. 
After these words, the children, knowing all the rules, took a sheet of paper and a pencil. Giselle began to draw. She depicted Father Theodore with wings like an angel, towering over all the group's participants. But she didn't draw the children's faces. Instead of mouths, noses, and eyes, she wrote the names of diseases or ailments that she knew. Instead of a face, someone had aloofness, someone had a sick heart. The girl who stood in the middle had diabetes written instead of a face. That's how Giselle depicted herself. When all the little figures were drawn, she crossed out the diagnoses, as if indicating that in the future, everyone would be cured. They would be cured of sad thoughts, of strabismus, and of some unknown illnesses she had heard about somewhere. There were no sick children in their group, apart from Giselle. But they were all vulnerable in their own way. The girl was about to fold the piece of paper and put it into her school backpack when she remembered her dad. Quickly, she drew a man in the blank space and instead of a face, she wrote ghosts of the past. She crossed out the inscription again and thought, let dad stop suffering from memories of mom. Magic or coincidence, but at that very moment, sitting by the window of his office, Eugene finally made a decision. He took out his phone and dialed the number Paulina had left him. His heart pounded harder as he entered the digits. Finally, after much hesitation, he pressed the call button. The ring seemed to go on forever, and it seemed like no one would answer. But then, finally, the man heard a familiar voice. Hello? Paulina, it's Eugene, he said, trying to keep the tremor out of his voice. Eugene. How nice to hear from you, came the joyful note in response. I didn't think you would call, it's been a month since we met. Yes. I just, the man hesitated. It doesn't matter, said Paulina, and Eugene felt a sense of ease and comfort. I would like to suggest meeting this week. Maybe at a cafe downtown? Eugene suggested, feeling his voice tremble slightly. Sounds wonderful. I agree. How about Friday evening? Paulina suggested. Great Eugene agreed, feeling hope for something new and beautiful awakened in his heart. I'll be looking forward to it. Eugene felt as if magic had enveloped this moment. He smiled, thanking fate for bringing Paulina into his life. But he couldn't even imagine what their chance encounter would ultimately lead to. Arriving home, he prepared dinner and called his daughter to the table. Giselle. Dad, I'm not hungry. I'll stay in my room. Eugene noticed that his daughter had become quieter and less talkative lately. Before, they always had breakfast and dinner together, chatting about nonsense and discussing plans for the upcoming weekends. Now Giselle preferred to have dinner quietly and then quickly retreat to her room. Maybe it's the teenage years? But she's only 11, thought the man. No, Giselle, you have to eat. I'm waiting for you. Reluctantly, the girl came down from the second floor of their small but cozy house. Is something wrong with you? Tell me, I'll help you. Everything's fine, Dad, the girl said irritably. Yesterday your teacher called me. She said you stopped talking to your friends. What are their names? Jimena and the man paused, unable to remember the second girl's name. Did you have a fight with them? No, Giselle answered curtly. Also, your grades have gotten worse. You're constantly distracted in class. And sometimes instead of doing your assignments, you're just drawing. Eugene's voice became rough and stern. He tried to keep himself in check and not raise his voice at his daughter, but the whole situation and Giselle's detachment irritated and even scared him. Your teacher gave me this drawing. What are these strange symbols you're drawing? Giselle glanced at the piece of paper depicting the symbolism of a secret society, a sun within a triangle. She reached for the paper, her blouse sleeve sliding up to reveal her wrist. What's this? Eugenio grabbed his daughter's hand. Why did you draw this? What does it mean? On the girl's wrist was the same symbol, the sun within a triangle. It's henna. It'll wash off, Giselle said, pulling her hand away and starting to eat. Dad, stop bothering me. It's just trendy right now. So, I drew it. And on the paper, it's just a sketch. 
I'm not going to draw on my skin something I haven't tested on paper. Giselle was a smart girl. She understood that if she didn't lie to her father now, it could lead to even more questions and problems. She looked at Eugenio with a convincing gaze, hoping he would believe her lie. Eugenio, not entirely convinced, decided to take her word for it. He felt unsure, not knowing what was happening with Giselle, but he didn't want to scare her or make the situation more tense. All right, he finally said, but please, be more careful. I just want to know that you're okay. Giselle didn't react to his words. To lighten the mood, the man decided to tell his daughter about his plans. I'll be late on Friday. Can you manage here without me? The girl remained silent. I'll come home after work, change, and go on a date, he said with enthusiasm. But his daughter's reaction surprised him. Don't worry, Dad, I'll manage without you. What's going on with my daughter? Eugenio thought to himself. Just a month ago, she told me she wanted me to find a wife, and now she doesn't care. Giselle, tell me, what's bothering you? I can see something's not right. Without answering her father's question, Giselle got up from the table and headed to her room. Her father sadly watched her go, then started clearing the plates into the sink. Friday arrived. The day of the meeting with Paulina. Eugenio woke up feeling light and excited in his heart. But he was still worried about Giselle. After preparing breakfast, he called his daughter to the table. He hoped this time they could have a conversation. He wanted to restore their old morning chats, but the new attempt proved unsuccessful. Do you remember we talked about superpowers? Eugenio started. As expected, the girl didn't respond. So, I would like to have the gift. Unexpectedly, Giselle interrupted her father. You won't have any gift. There's so much evil in your soul, but you don't even realize it. You don't see it. You're blind. Eugenio was surprised by such an emotional reaction. What are you talking about, Giselle? Everything that happens around you is bad. Mom died. I'm sick. God is punishing you so you suffer. But somehow, others end up being the martyrs. I'm sick because of you. Giselle, her father raised his voice. I'll walk to school. Eugenio didn't stop the girl. He sat in a stupor at the table, staring at the half-eaten oatmeal. A million thoughts raced through his head, a million questions. What had happened to his radiant and cheerful Giselle? He was so deeply engrossed in his thoughts and reflections that he almost forgot about his date with Paulina. Returning home after work, he tried again to talk to his daughter. Eugenio entered her room, but the girl abruptly jumped up from behind the writing desk and fled to the bathroom. It was the only room with a bolted door. He didn't chase after her. He looked around. Once a bright and tidy space had turned into a realm of chaos and disorder. Things were strewn everywhere, textbooks, hair ties, and stationery. Next to the bed was a writing desk with notebooks. Eugenio thought it was just a regular school notebook, so he opened one without hesitation. But inside were not math examples. In the upper corner of each page was a symbol he recognized, the triangle with a sun in the middle. There were no notes in the notebook, only drawings. Giselle was a talented artist. She inherited the gift from her mother. But whereas before his daughter depicted bright and joyful moments, now he saw strange, even frightening images on the notebook's pages. He closed the notebook, and his gaze fell on a folded A4 sheet. He unfolded it, and an unpleasant shiver ran through his body. A man with long hair, drawn with a simple pencil, was staring at Eugenio from the piece of paper. But then he noticed something else. In the corner was the same triangle with a sun, the symbol he saw on the notebook pages. It was more than just a random coincidence. Just as Eugenio reached for his phone to call Paulina and cancel their date, he heard footsteps approaching the room. He looked up and saw Giselle standing before him with a questioning gaze. Dad, are you rummaging through my things? She asked, with a hint of uncertainty and anger in her voice. Eugenio demanded an explanation with all his inherent sternness. Well, Dad, 
Giselle's voice softened. He's a famous singer. We even listened to a couple of his songs on the radio. She said the first thing that came to her mind, knowing her father wouldn't bother checking her words for truth. And what about the triangle with the sun everywhere? There was anger in her father's voice, which used to scare Giselle, but now she knew that under no circumstances should her father find out the truth. Oh, that's the emblem of his new album. Her father pondered. Could his paranoid thoughts have nothing to do with reality? Maybe Giselle was just going through a transitional phase. Dad, please, don't worry. Weren't you supposed to go on a date tonight? Yes, but I'm thinking of canceling it, Eugenio admitted honestly. Don't do anything foolish. I'll be glad if I have a stepmother, Giselle approached her father and hugged him. Finally, thought Eugenio. These hugs reassured him that everything was fine, that Giselle was just growing up, and that he needed to accept it. He kissed his daughter on the forehead and started getting ready for his date with Paulina. Entering the restaurant, Eugenio noticed Paulina sitting at a table by the window. Her smile made his heart skip a beat. They exchanged glances, and in that moment, Eugenio felt like this evening would be unforgettable. Oh, how right he was. Paulina talked about her work. She was a journalist conducting independent investigations. That's why she found herself on the other side of town that night. Of course, she couldn't reveal all the information until the investigation was complete. So, they talked about travel, movies, and music. I have a record player at home. It's not mine. It belongs to the landlady from whom I rent the apartment. But she showed me how to use it and left some vinyl records, Paulina said. Really? I've wanted to get one for myself for a long time, but money goes into more important purchases. I remember, in my childhood, we used to listen to music with my parents every evening. And then I would play records for my wife. It became a family ritual for me. In those moments, I always felt love and warmth, Eugenio said, for the first time not feeling the pain of loss as he spoke these words. But when my wife needed medicine, I had to sell the player. I didn't earn much back then, so I sold everything I had just to find the money. Oh, I'd love to listen to something from the 80s now. Then let's go to my place, Paulina said enthusiastically, and Eugenio couldn't refuse. As they rode in the taxi, Eugenio couldn't take his eyes off Paulina. Her appearance couldn't be called model-like, but there was something warm and pleasant in her features. And her smile seemed to light up everything around. Was he falling in love? They climbed to the third floor of a small apartment building. This was where Paulina rented her apartment. The apartment was small but cozy. At the entrance, they were greeted by a narrow hallway with a small chest of drawers with a mirror. A soft rug lay on the floor, creating a sense of warmth and comfort. The living room and kitchen were combined into one space, making the apartment feel more spacious and bright. Eugenio's gaze fell on the writing desk and the corkboard hanging nearby. While Paulina searched for the right record, he decided to examine what interesting things were pinned to this board. As he approached, his heart pounded wildly. It felt like he had entered a terrifying, tangled dream from which he couldn't escape. He leaned against the edge of the table to keep from falling. Paulina, he addressed his crush. She, noticing that he was examining materials related to her work, stopped looking through records and explained, I'm investigating a cult, don't mind it. A cult? Eugenio barely managed to say. Yes. They recruit children and teenagers into their group. And then, have you heard about the recent terrorist attack supposedly committed by a 12-year-old boy? Paulina approached him. She didn't see the fear and confusion in his eyes as he stood with his back to her, examining the drawings pinned to the corkboard. There was the emblem of the sun in the triangle. There was also a flyer with the image of a man, the same one he saw in the drawings of Giselle. Eugenio frantically pulled out his phone from his pocket and started dialing his daughter. The phone rang, but nobody answered. Then he heard a robotic voice. The phone was unreachable. I need to get home urgently. Eugenio said sharply and hurried towards the exit. What happened? 
You look agitated, Paulina didn't understand and initially tried to stop the man. Wait. At least explain what happened. I can't let you go in such a state. The man had already dashed out of the apartment. Paulina followed him, barely managing to lock the apartment door. She caught up with Eugenio as he was getting into a taxi. She managed to jump into the back seat, saying, I'm coming with you. They headed to the other end of the city. Along the way, the man told Paulina about Giselle, about the strange drawings he found in her room and on her hand. He also told her how she became distant and unsociable, stopped communicating with her peers, and became rude to her father. Paulina recognized all these distinctive markers in children's behavior, exactly how all the cult members would start to behave, as if copied. I was foolish. Why didn't I bring my laptop? Paulina thought. I saw Giselle. She has diabetes, right? Eugenio replied with concern in his voice. They both understood the danger the girl was in right now. Don't worry, Teodoro, the sect leader didn't plan a meeting today. She's probably at home, Paulina tried to reassure the man. But her words didn't comfort him at all. The father's heart felt something was wrong. When they arrived at the house, the man jumped out of the car, forgetting to pay the taxi driver. Paulina left a couple of bills for the driver and said, keep the change. She ran after Eugenio. Giselle, sweetheart. The father's heart was breaking. Giselle, where are you? He searched every room, but couldn't find his little princess anywhere. Overwhelmed with helplessness, he fell to the floor and cried. Is this your car parked outside the house? Paulina asked sternly. I don't hear an answer. She lifted his head and looked into his tear-filled eyes. Eugenio nodded. Give me the keys and get in the car, the girl commanded. Quickly. We can't delay now. Eugenio was struck by Paulina's assertiveness. She took the keys and started the engine. Eugenio got in beside her. I know where she is. Exceeding all speed limits, they arrived at a small building located behind the church. Paulina burst in immediately, followed by Eugenio. Maria? What are you doing here? Theodore sat on the floor, with a small 11-year-old girl sitting beside him. Giselle. The man rushed to his daughter, but she, not understanding anything, tried to push him away. And you? You? Eugenio turned and struck Theodore. Dad, stop it. The girl burst into tears. There's so much evil in you, she whispered. Giselle, did you remove the pump? Where's the insulin? Eugenio rushed to the little backpack the girl always carried with her. While he searched for insulin to give her an injection, Paulina had already called the police. Maria, what's going on? Theodore said as soon as he recovered from the blow. My name is not Maria, and yours is not Theodore. Nice to meet you, Alvaro Castrastro. The police arrived quickly. They arrested Alvaro Castrastro, the founder of extremist groups and sections. During the process, one of the police officers approached Paulina and said, You know, we don't have any evidence. We'll have to release him again. I have everything. Paulina, these drawings and incomprehensible speeches can't be linked to child terrorist acts, the policeman said with a hint of hopelessness in his voice. I'll bring everything to the station within an hour, Paulina said. But at that moment, she had no evidence either. But she felt that Theodore, or rather Alvaro, was discussing something very important with Giselle. I'll go home, and then to the police station. I'll be in touch if anything happens, Paulina said, kissing Eugenio on the lips. She was surprised by her own behavior. She had always been more reserved. Eugenio, holding his daughter's hand tightly, smiled. We're going home. Giselle needs to calm down and recover. Paulina headed to her apartment. She needed her laptop. As soon as the girl joined this cult, she immediately installed hidden cameras and recording devices in the room where all the meetings took place. Every evening she reviewed the recordings, but there was nothing compromising. 
Alvaro Castrestro's words were always elusive and ambiguous. Paulina turned on her laptop, opened a special application, and started reviewing the recording. She fast-forwarded to the moment when Giselle entered the building. So, you managed to come after all, Alvaro said. Yes, Father Teodor. As soon as I made sure Father had left, I headed to you. But I was afraid that I wouldn't succeed. He came into my room, rummaged through my things, and saw the drawings. He said he would cancel his plans because of me. But I lied, and he believed me. A lie for a good cause is a virtue. But what he did was unethical. One should not invade others' thoughts and belongings, Alvaro spoke. And did you remove the insulin pump, as I instructed? I'm sorry, but I couldn't. I came without it, but I took insulin in my backpack. If you don't listen to me, you will never heal. Giselle lowered her head sadly. Alvaro gestured for her to sit on the floor next to him. My child, you understand that you are special, he began. Only you can change this world, that's why you're here. He chose you. Alvaro pointed his finger to the sky. You, my dear Giselle, can bring light into darkness. But for that, you will have to undergo a trial. And only through this trial can you rid this world of evil. I know, my diabetes is evil. And by ridding the world of evil, I will heal myself. You're a very smart girl, smarter than many I've met. What do I need to do? The girl asked with interest and courage. I'll give you a heavy school backpack. You must take it to the market square on Sunday morning. Under no circumstances should you open the backpack. You must find the busiest place and stand in the center. I'll tell you the exact time. Not a second later, not a second earlier. At a certain time, you must stand there. And what to do next? Giselle asked. Then you need to be brave and strong, follow the call of your heart, and trust what happens. You must fear nothing. The world around you will start to change, and then you will understand everything. Show me the backpack. Is it very heavy? I left it at home. But tomorrow evening. And at that moment, Paulina and Eugenio burst into the building. Paulina paused the recording. She felt sick at the thought of what could have happened. And if what Alvaro had planned for Sunday had happened, she would blame herself. She grabbed her laptop and headed to the police station. No one will get hurt now. The police searched Alvaro Sedastro's house and found a school backpack with explosives. The video captured by hidden cameras also contributed to the case. Alvaro was to spend the rest of his days in prison. Giselle couldn't believe what was happening for a long time. The whole world she believed in collapsed overnight. And until her dad, Theodore, was imprisoned, she thought it was all a big mistake. Or maybe evil had just led her astray again. Eugene had many conversations with his daughter. He didn't shout or scold, managing his emotions. He told Giselle about various cults, how they gain trust, and how dangerous it is. Only with time did the girl realize how wrong she was, and she was scared at the thought that her father could lose her too. Dad, remember I said I was sick because of you? Unfortunately, I do, Eugene sadly replied. Those words pierced his heart like icy shards. Forgive me. You've done so much. You've always been there and helped. You were not just a father to me, but also a mother. I'm sorry for hiding everything about you, sorry for saying hurtful things, for not talking to you. Please forgive me, Giselle burst into tears and immersed herself in her father's embrace. My Giselle, my princess. Of course, I forgive you. Because I love you so much. Do you love Paulina too? The girl wiped away her tears. I'll tell you a secret, yes, I love her. And do you know why she didn't go back to her city after the investigation? Why not? The girl smiled, already guessing what answer she would hear. It seems she loves me too. Are you okay if I suggest her to move in with us? Hooray! The girl squealed and started dancing. Eugene laughed. There was his beloved princess, his darling daughter Giselle. So happy and carefree. 
Dear viewers, if you enjoyed the story, please support the video by liking it and leaving a comment. Thank you very much.